Hi, I'm Nikki Hodgson and welcome to the 2021 National Student Pride Women's Panel. Well, it's been a wild ride of a year, to put it mildly. The pandemic and lockdown specifically has created unique challenges for LGBTQI plus women, particularly those living in unsafe environments, including where they aren't free to be out about their sexuality. Older members of the community have been some of the most isolated, homeless women have been some of the most vulnerable, while healthcare provision has failed to understand and meet the needs of many LGBTQI women altogether. So, while the UK government has pledged to finally ban gay conversion therapy, there's also been some heartwarming stories of virtual communities coming together to help support those in need. So, what stood out for our panellists this year during this most bizarre of times? Well, if you're watching this and you want to post a comment on social media about us, then please use the at Student Pride and also use the hashtag NSP2021. So with no further ado, let's introduce our panel today. Uh, so first of all, I have Sophie Duker, who's a bisexual comedian and writer. Sophie was educated at Oxford University and launched onto the comedy scene in 2015, being shortlisted for a Funny Woman Award. Most recently, she's had a sold out show, Venus, which explores what it means to be a bisexual woman in nowadays political and social climate, which was a roaring success and sold out at the Edinburgh Fringe and Soho Theatre. You might have also seen her on shows such as Mock the Week, Frankie Boyle's New World Order and 8 Out of 10 Cats. Welcome Sophie. Hello. Next to Sophie, we've got Florence Schechter, who is a science communicator and also works on screen and on stage. She's a comedian, presenter, video producer, trainer and is also the founder and director of the world's first bricks and mortar vagina museum. She graduated in 2014 with a BSc in biochemistry at the University of Birmingham, and she's an also an expert contributor on the TV documentary, Engineering Catastrophes. And next to Florence, we've got Abigail Thorne. Abigail Thorne is an actress and YouTuber. She's the creator and star of Philosophy Tube, which has of January 2021, around 830,000 subscribers. So you're nearly at the million mark there, right? Yeah, I think we're about 930 now. Okay, yeah. pushing a million. <laughs> In 2019, Thorne hosted a live stream on Twitch in which she read plays from the complete works of Shakespeare for the mental health charity Samaritans. The stream lasted five days, featured a number of guests and raised over £100,000 for the charity. So we've got a wonderful panel here, multi-talented on so many levels. I'm really excited for you all to have this conversation with me today. Um, where shall I start? Well, okay, Sophie, I'll start with you. How do you feel the year has been for LGBTQI women? Oh. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> a small question to, to get off going with. an easy with. one. Uh, I'd say it's been a mixed bag. It's been a, a little. Uh, the thing is, it's. I think it's. It's inescapable that this year has been pretty shit across the board. I don't know if we can swear, but I won't do it again. Uh, uh, I feel like this year has been really hard, and it's tested a lot of us in different ways. I think having to deal with sort of isolation from for like me personally being in like the spaces where you would like gather or find sustenance from your community that's kind of been shut down mm. that's gone online which is great in that it's become more accessible to people that have different needs or people that were isolated anyway but also has its own challenges because everything is online so I think it's been a really testing year but one where there have been like glimmers of hope okay that's that's good to know that's reasonably optimistic yeah. Florence what about you Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, it's definitely been difficult. Um, I think also there's like bigger stuff going on, you know, like recently the, the LGBT, what was it the advisory panel um, was dissolved in our country. And there's like, there's a there's a lot of really, really difficult things happening on a global scale. But I totally agree with Sophie about that, like, being online has actually opened up a lot of things. So at the Vagina Museum, for example, we did um, events online and we got feedback from a lot of people being like this is amazing you know I am um, disabled and I can't leave the house very often and so doing online events means I get to just like do more fun things and it's and they were like please please can you continue doing digital events and um, and we are going to so I think it's definitely opened up um, our eyes to the things that we didn't realize were possible. Mm. Yeah, that's a really nice point. Mm. Abigail, how's it been for you? What's your been like, year been like? How do you feel about things? Uh, well, it's been pretty exciting. Uh, 
as yeah, echoing what you two have said, it has been a tough year. But now that you're all coming online, which is where I already was, I'm like, oh, it's kind of crowded in here. Suddenly, suddenly everyone wants to talk to YouTubers and Twitch streamers. Everyone wants to know the skills. And I'm like, wow, OK, welcome, welcome to the club. You're in a good position then. Perfect. So w one of the things I want to talk about is wokeness and the perception of it and how it has, I don't know, maybe affected the queer community this year. Because I feel like, I don't know, maybe the community isn't in control of the conversation at the minute and maybe that's not such a good thing. So Abigail, actually, I'll come to you first. How, what, how do you feel the conversation around wokeness is affecting your work and your life at the minute? Uh, well, to be frank, I think it's often a smokescreen to avoid talking about material realities. I think mm. I hear a lot of people say, oh, we're sick of all these woke activists and so on. And it's like, well, we're always talking about this culture war stuff and not so much about, for instance, health inequalities, uh, women's access to shelters and material inequalities like that. So I, I broadly see it as a distraction from material issues, um, but I, I, I'm happy to be corrected on that. Yeah, Sophie, what do you think about it? I think it's difficult. I think when the idea of wokeness like sort of popped up in public discourse, I think there were kind of so there was sort of a better understanding of what it actually meant. Like people were like, okay, I'm being aware, I'm being alert to social injustice. And now it's kind of just like, uh, it's like a term like hipster. It's like used to like, like buy like the mainstream to level at people that they see like, they're like, okay, you're part of this like woke demographic. It's sort of like a brush of tar people with. Um, I think that What's depressing is that so many more young people are really engaged by conversations and naturally want to develop their language and understand things. And they're actively being discouraged from being educated and sensitive about how they speak about things. I really do agree that a lot of the time people don't necessarily care about like the detail, like they just want like to be able to eat or live or be safe. But I think that wokeness is is not like really like a personality trait. And it's something that people should be actively encouraged to pursue rather than some sort of slur. Mm, absolutely. Florence, do you have this term leveled at you and the museum <laughs> a lot? Yeah, definitely. I think what's really difficult about this idea of woke, which I think you kind of hinted at was that it kind of puts us all into one big box that you can then just kind of make assumptions about but actually what one would consider woke is actually a huge variety of different um different viewpoints different ideas different philosophies um and so you, you can't lump us all in you know like for example people are like oh you know if you fight for women's rights then that means you're woke but then at the vagina museum you know we get a lot of like transphobes who who get really upset at us because we're trans inclusive and then they're like but how can you fight for women's rights if you can't even define women and it's like look at us fighting for women's rights every single day look at us you know like bringing up issues all, all these different issues what, like I don't understand why they think that we're shutting down conversations when we are actually having these conversations it's just like we're doing them in a gender inclusive mm -hmm. way um, and so it's very frustrating because then the right wing generally would put us and transphobes in the same box because we're all like fighting for women's rights, you know? Yeah, yeah. It feels like it's been co-opted. So yeah, that's why I wanted to ask you about it. Um, all right, something happier. What do we think about pop culture this year? Because I think obviously, you know, we haven't had many outlets for fun. Maybe watching things has been one of the only ones. Um, Abigail, what do you reckon? Has there been a kind of pop culture moment that's cheered you up during the pandemic? Well, babes, you introduced me by saying that I spent five days reading Shakespeare. So I have to say, <laughs> I'm not entirely like, I'm not entirely tuned into pop culture, like other than YouTube, which is sort of its own weird zone off to the side of pop culture. Um, so I have to say, I'm, I'm, I was planning on taking notes in this section from all of you because <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't know. So what's good? What should I be watching? Oh. Yeah, what's good? What does I, anybody else think? I feel like something that has been like, the thing is that sometimes I'm like, in this time where I go for solace is to be like warm hugged by my community. So I don't know how much like muggles have appreciated this thing, but RuPaul's Drag Race UK has been such a source of joy. I think both, all, both the drag races, even though drag race is problematic in its own <laughs> way, I think like the bing bang bong of it all and having that sort of kind of like togetherness, like watching shows, like being like part of like, community in that way and then like looking at responses to it on Twitter has been really really like affirming yeah. and 
I, yeah, I really, I really appreciated being able to do that. I think that's a big queer moment over the last year or even the last few months. Cause yeah. it's- Florence, are you a fan of drag race or is there something else that you prefer? Um, uh, I, I like, I like lots of things. Um, I think some really important moments, Lil Nas X, oh, twerking yes. on Satan mm -hmm. in love. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that was a big one. I also, you know, at the start of lockdown, um, massively binged uh, Netflix and like watched all the things that I never had time to watch before. So I watched She-Ra and completely and utterly fell in love and I want Catra to be my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also it was really nice because it was like, yes, one day when I have kids, then I, I'm gonna show them this show and I've like mentally bookmarked it, mostly just so I can watch it again. Yeah. <laughs> That's Aww. a good one. That's a good one, definitely. Um, hmm, moving on to something a little bit more serious then. Obviously, mental health has been constantly in the news this year for obvious reasons. And we know that before the pandemic, LGBTQI women were suffering anyway, more than lots of people. So do we think that the general conversation around mental health has been good for us? Has it improved awareness or, you know, has the kind of, I don't know, the onus been taken away and put on other people? I don't know. I don't know what you think about that. Sophie, what do you reckon? I think it's a difficult time because I think what has been apparent is that the pandemic has impacted everyone's mental health. But I think that it can sometimes feel like your specific problems, your specific like way of feeling is caught up in this big like national malaise and things get diluted and like people don't get understood because of course everyone's having a terrible, a terrible time. Of course, everyone's mental health is being impacted. But there are sort of... I think, I think sometimes when everyone's feeling down or if everyone's struggling, it can be hard to locate the people that need help the most, I think. So it doesn't help to know that other people are feeling down if you're like mourning a loved one or if you're dealing with like your own like anxieties, if you have to shield. I think that it's kind of, I think that it feels like because we haven't been outside and checking in on people because everyone has their own stuff to deal with, I feel like some people might have felt like they've got left behind a little bit and not know how to really ask for help. Yeah, absolutely. Florence, what do you reckon about that? I, I'm, what I'm really hoping from this whole experience is that we as a society kind of understand a bit more that like self-care isn't like having a bath and whatever. Self-care is like setting boundaries. It's about like anti-poverty government policy. It's about much bigger things and it's about things like anti-capitalism and you know like not being exploited and standing up for each other because you know being being inside though like for example there was this thought that i saw going around that perhaps the reason that um the black lives matter protests happened with such force in 2020 was that being stuck inside we all kind of realized what was really important um and that we just like couldn't we couldn't stand for it anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's then kind of filtered into other areas of, of activism, realizing that activism itself is self-care and that me these mental health issues that we're having are not going to be fixed by like doing CBT a lot of the time. They're gonna be fixed by mm -hmm. like the government, you know, not treating us like like horrible. I, I, I agree with what you're yeah. saying that kind of putting an emphasis on self-care and bath bombs and that sort of thing makes it your individual mm. responsibility to take care of yourself but there are certain needs that we have as a society and as a community that aren't being met mm. and it's not sometimes people need other people well we need the government to lift mm. us up to help us so yeah I agree with you on that. Mm. Mm. Yeah Abigail I can see you nodding through all of that yeah, especially as a I, philosopher you must have some quite strong opinions about how government interferes or doesn't help when it needs to. Definitely. Well, my go-to writer on mental health has always been Mark Fisher's Capitalist Realism. You're nodding along. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I sense you might, you might, might have done it. Um, so there's this image that I, that I get from Fisher, which is that uh, the mental health crisis, it's like we're all living next to a smokestack. And we see all of these stories about, oh, it's terribly difficult having lung diseases from living next to the smokestack. And, oh, we must all be support people who are talking about how hard it is for them to have the diseases from living next to the smokestack. And actually, he says, you know what? What's the smokestack? What's the cause? And I think to really help people's mental health in this country, certainly the trans community, it would be nice to have equal rights, health care. And whilst we're on the subject, free housing would be nice as well. Yeah. Some basic things, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And so actually moving on from that, obviously we mentioned Black Lives Matter. How do we feel that black and ethnic minority 
uh, queer community have been treated this year? Because it has been a tough year, right, Sophie? What do yeah, you think? Yeah, it's been a tough year. I think that, obviously, as a queer person of colour, you're usually dealing with overlapping identities just as, like, a starting-off point. So, as a black woman, I was obviously affected by the Black Lives Matter protests and, like, the sort of, like, tidal wave of anti-blackness that seems to be sweeping the globe. Mm -hmm obviously affected by stuff like issues around women's safety, like with Sarah Everard. Yeah. But I think the thing that's the most telling, and I'm going to drag the show that I just mentioned, is that when we had something, when we had RuPaul's Drag Race UK, there was an episode in which uh, the girls were asked to do a queer icon mm -hmm. and not a single queer woman of colour really sprang to mind. I think the lack of visibility around women, women of queer women of colour is it's like it's been going on for so long and there were amazing women in the UK people like Rita Loy or Lady Phil who are doing amazing things there are people that you'll see on Instagram who are like kind of constantly advocating for themselves and I think that it shouldn't be down to queer women of color just to advocate for themselves to make themselves visible they should be celebrated on different platforms and their queerness should be celebrated as part of that but that hasn't happened to the stage where people can be seen by the, by like the mainstream, even within the community, as iconic. Um, I also think that if you are a person of colour in this country, you probably have links to um, other countries. You probably have uh, like heritage or parentage that's linked to other places. Uh, so my heritage, um, my father's from Ghana, and in Ghana, the like LGBT safe space, the only LGBT safe space in Ghana, was raided by the police and shut down. And I think there needs to be more sense that there's like a joined up responsibility as a global community to highlight injustices that happen all over the world and affect uh, queer people of colour. Mm. So, yeah. How do you think we can be better allies within the community? I think it's, I think it's about initially about noticing, about noticing in action. And I think that we'll all have our sort of unintentional cliques or people with whom we feel safest, but I think we need to realise that we need to amplify and help people that aren't like us. We need to amplify women who have children, older women, people that have different accessibility needs. And in terms of being a person of colour within the community, I think it's kind of a sense of like tokenism or being ignored. Mm. I think it's, it's people need to put real effort and energy into amplifying voices and giving opportunities and space to people that aren't as represented. Mm, that's really good to hear. Abigail, so I know you've spoken up about the state of trans rights and safety and access to healthcare this year in particular. And, um, you know, still in the news has not been very positive. What needs to change in order for Britain to feel like a more welcome place to be trans, do you think? How long have you got? <laughs> Take as long as you need. <laughs> uh, equal rights in healthcare would be nice. Yeah. I'd like to be able to get married the same way a cis person can. I'd like to be able to start a family maybe the same way that a cis person can. Mm. Um, I would like to be able to access the same healthcare that cis women can get. I would like for my trans brothers and my trans non-binary siblings to be able to get the healthcare they need. I would like my non-binary siblings uh, to even be acknowledged to exist at all by the government. I'd like to be able to use the same NHS that everyone else does and not have to wait 26 years to attend a segregated clinic to get the exact same medicine that a postmenopausal woman can get from her GP. I think that's a huge waste of time. And I would like it very much if every single trans person I know wasn't planning how to leave the country. So we've yeah. got a long way to go. We have, and that's really damning that people feel that there is no better choice but to leave. Mm -hmm. I just read actually on Twitter that um, people, uh, trans people in Scotland found that they were being left off the vaccination list for COVID because oh, when wow. their name changed, uh, or when they changed their name, um, the, like, the records ended up not matching up and then they're not, mm -hmm. so they're not being invited for, for vaccinations. So it's not even just like specifically, you know, trans healthcare, it's like everything. everything. Yeah, everything. Okay, that's pretty damning, but something to concentrate on for this year, for sure. Sorry, I can't be the bearer. No, no <laughs> absolutely. We don't want good news if it's not true, so there we go. Um, thinking more generally, how can we all be better allies to each other? Because, uh, you know, when I was asked to host this panel, we were talking a lot about intersectionality and how well is it going and 
do people feel like we're having the right conversations across our differences as well as our similarities? So Florence, is there anything that comes to mind for you on that? How can we be better allies for each other? Wow. Um, I think definitely uh, listening to other people when they, when they tell you something is a problem. Like um, as a Jewish woman, for example, um, that we sit in this really weird um, place in the sort of like racial construct where I am perceived as white by the vast, vast majority of, of society, but the white supremacist machine does not consider me white. And I like, you know, I am the subject of, of anti-Semitism all the time, but then on, you know, things like the BBC will be having debates of like, do Jews count as an ethnic minority, you know? And um, when Jews have come forward to say like, actually, yeah, we are subject to this very specific type of racism, um, anti-Semitism, um, that like, you need to stop pretending like it's not a thing, like David Baddiel wrote this whole book called Jews Don't Count, mm -hmm. which kind of explores this idea. And, and it's really frustrating because like the Jewish community have been saying this all the time. And like people just, they say, well, Jews don't count. We're not gonna listen to you. Like you've, you've won, it's fine. You survived the Holocaust. Like what have you got left to worry about? And like, it's very frustrating having to say these things but then no one listen. And then you're like, what, what else can I do at this point? Mm. <laughs> Apart from talk now and raise awareness and then people hopefully mm. listen, right? Yeah, I know, but then what do you do when people don't listen? Mm. Ge that's, that's a, that's a, really a genuine question. question. <laughs> that's a really good question. Has anyone else got an answer to that? What do you do when people don't listen to you? Apart from punch them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What are we allowed to say? As someone who works in public education, I've struggled with that for seven years, is that, and especially now, having done six years worth of public education work before I came out, and now seeing the difference now that I'm out, it's, yeah, some people just really are not interested. And that's been the question that's haunted me as long as I've been teaching and doing my work is what do you do when people don't want to know? Yeah. Do you feel that starts at home with kids? I mean, when we're talking about people not listening, is it something that starts very early on or do people sort of tune out as they grow up sometimes? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I have audiences across different age groups and, I have been very surprised sometimes by how people do sometimes want to learn very quickly. I had a conversation a while ago with a lady and we'd been chatting for 15 minutes and eventually it came up that I was trans and she said, what's that? And I was like, oh, uh, so I told her in 30 seconds and she'd never heard of it. And she was like, that's amazing. That's the best thing I've ever heard. That's so good. <laughs> so people I think are keen to learn and to change when given the chance and when it's not their job on the line if they change. Mm. Because I know that some people in some media organizations perhaps, would like to do more for trans people, but they're worried because if they say anything, it's their job. Mm. So I think when people are given the space to grow, most of the time, most people are mostly good. Yeah. I hope. I hope. Yeah. We hope, that's nice to think. We will find out. <laughs> yeah. Sophie, do you have any thoughts on that? How do you get people to listen that aren't listening? I think that, I think that the way to get people to listen, and I'm very wary of, saying this because I think that something that is often said to minorities or marginalized people is to be so good that they can't ignore you. And I think that puts a lot of strain on people who are like the figureheads or the first or the person that will get wheeled out to talk about things to constantly have to say the right things or be an exemplar or have the answers is really, really difficult. But I think that what possibly the pandemic and recent times have shown us is that the traditional paths to success, the traditional paths to having a voice are not ones that we need to utilize going forward. There are different ways, there are different things that you can put your faith in, different ways that you can fundraise, different ways that you can make money. And I think that having those, like those alternative systems of support, having those systems of support that will help your mental health, that will like raise money for people in the community, that will make people listen because they, will, they won't be able to ignore sort of our, pro our progress as queer people, yeah. our existence as queer people. And so I think that trying to find those alternatives to a door that keeps getting shut in your face is what we can start doing when mm. the government won't listen or the media institution yeah. won't listen is by finding, by finding alternatives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Being able to build it ourselves mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I had a powerful moment recently where when I was very little, I used to practice reading by reading my mum's copy of The Times. And in November of last year, 
the Times called trans people an epidemic. And I had this moment where I thought, God, this paper that I used to read as a child, now they're calling me a disease. And then I had this moment of, well, my audience now is bigger than the Sunday Times. Mm -hmm. And I built that myself. So maybe the Sunday Times should practice reading me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Hell yes, I like that a lot. I think that should be yeah, a slogan for you, for sure. Okay, so maybe it hasn't been the best year for us. Uh, mixed bag there. What are we feeling optimistic about uh, going forward for 2021 into 2022? And it can be personal, it can be political, it can be neither of those. So, that's <laughs> probably just personal. I, I've not been to the pub, I've not been out since things opened again. Um, I am really looking forward to being able to gather. I'm looking forward to Pride, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to Black Pride, I'm looking forward to uh, running my comedy night called Wacky Races, which I run, and being around other queer people. I think just that sort of togetherness, whether or not it's uh, like sanitised or socially <laughs> distanced, but that being able to just make those real life connections is something that I'm really, really excited about. Um, yeah, just being in space again, even being able to be here in this very, like, you know, kind of carefully organised <laughs> safe space is wonderful. Being in heaven is wonderful. So I think even, and it doesn't have to be a sort of like going out, like partying thing, but just seeing, seeing people in like holding space and take, taking up physical space outside the bedroom is something that I'm mm. so excited <laughs> to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Florence, what do you think? Anything that's standing out for you? Um, I'm, I'm really hoping that some of the um, kind of political changes that people are trying to push through will happen. Um, like, you know, like trying to ban conversion therapy, finally. Um, or like, for example, be past the pregnancy British Pregnancy Advisory Service have been doing a big campaign about making abortion services um, available via telemedicine as a permanent change. Um, because that would that would massively increase access, um, you know, getting on the subject of abortion, actually providing abortion services in Northern Ireland, it has been uh, um, decriminalized, but um, it actually hasn't like happened yet officially. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of keeping all my fingers crossed for all of those things to happen. Yeah, I think they're all massive things that really do need to change, aren't they? Abigail, what about you? What's I'm looking forward to being able to see my family again once the lockdowns, because yeah. they're up in the north. Um, being able to see all of them again. I might like to go fishing with my dad again. We always <laughs> used to go before and it would be nice to go, you know, now, now in girl. Um, so that'll be fun. And uh, I think what would be nice in 2022, would be nice if we could get one political party, just one, I'm not bothered which one, saying we want equal rights for trans people. Because at the moment, none of them have. Even the Greens, they're like, well, it will help a little bit, but not full. I'm like, no, no, no. Yeah. It'd be nice to have at least one be like, you know what? full equality across the board. That would be nice. Do you think we need a new political party to do that? Mm, uh, to be honest, beggars can't be choosers, babes. <laughs> I will, I, I'll go for anyone. Yeah. I'm so upset right. with every single political party. I feel so disillusioned at the yeah. moment. I, ha I hate them all, genuinely, I hate them all. I mean, like, I'll still be like an anyone but Tory type person, mm. but that doesn't mean I'm happy with Labour in the slightest. Yeah. I'm yeah. so upset. Yeah. I, got my, I got my booklet for London Mayor and there's oh, yeah. 17 candidates. Oh none of them want equal rights for trans people. None of them at all. And I'm like, is this the best we've got? It's like, yeah. Oy. It does feel like we're regressing in some ways that we're in this position, mm -hmm. doesn't oh, it? We are regressing. Yeah. Yeah. We, we are. But, um, uh, the pandemic has massively set back so many equal rights mm -hmm. because like, for example, um, you know, m more women found themselves taking on the burden of the house and childcare. So like employment, for example, mm -hmm. has been, has taken a massive hit and it's, yeah, it's pushed back all areas of, of civil rights, yeah. this pandemic. And it's going to be interesting to see how long it's going to take to push things forward again, right? And yeah. hopefully some things won't stay back. So, um, okay, we've talked about what we're feeling optimistic about. On a kind of personal note, what are your projects or your cool things that you're working on that you're going to be out and about doing again? Abigail, let's start with you. Uh, well, this weekend, I am allowed to talk about this now, I checked. This weekend, <laughs> I am going to be filming a comedy series with the BBC, which is nice. I'm gonna be uh, in season two of an already established comedy, which is good. And I have also written a play, which is about national decline and trans identity and political radicalization that is in the pre-production stage. And I hope by spring 2022, it will be coming to a theater near you. <laughs> well, that's and I'm extremely gonna be like exciting. producing and writing and starring, because apparently I'm the transgender answer to Kenneth Branagh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, that sounds good. I think you can tell that one. 
Florence, what about you? I think the Vagina Museum is reopening, isn't it, Zoom? Uh, uh, hopefully, yes. Um, we, I mean, it depends on what the government says, but uh, we should be able to open in stage three of the COVID roadmap, and we'll be opening with a new exhibition, um, Periods, A Brief History, which is what it says on the tin, History of Menstruation. So that's really, really exciting. Um, and that, that's the main one. I'm, ju I'm just feeling a bit... I have to admit, I'm feeling a bit nervous because we have reopened twice already yeah. and then had to close like three weeks later. So I'm just reining in the hope. I'm feeling, mm -hmm. I'm feeling it very difficult to feel hopeful at the moment. But what, what's it like with the museum community in general? I mean, is it, are, are oh there people God. that you get to talk to? Are they connected? Do they support you? Where do you feel? Oh, into yeah, that? the museum community love us. It's hilarious going to somewhere like super you know, like straight, like the Imperial War Museums. And they're like, can we have your advice on how to engage like hard to reach audiences? And like, I'm like, you're the Imperial War Museums. This is so weird. <laughs> I don't understand what's happening. So yeah, like in, very surprisingly, I think surprisingly, the museum com community is, is very supportive, but it's a, such a difficult time because it was a difficult time for just generally the arts and heritage before the pandemic because of budget cuts and austerity and all these things. And then the pandemic made it even worse and there are museums closing up and down the country um, because our government just don't really care about supporting them. Um, we've been in a very lucky position where our landlord has, you know, waived either entirely or partially our rent. Um, so we've managed to be able to survive. Um, but it's, it's definitely been a struggle. Um, fingers crossed we'll be around forever. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. Labia crossed. <laughs> <laughs> And for you this what, year? What am I doing? I am very excited to not be going to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. <laughs> um, I'm oh, so delighted to have an August back. Um, I got asked if I wanted to do the Fringe Festival, which is amazing. And I, I don't know in what form it will be back this year, if it is. But I said that doing the Fringe this year for me would be like agreeing to marry my former lover the day they got out of prison. <laughs> I feel like I'll wait a bit. And it's also nice to be thinking of doing different kinds of shows. I would like to do more live shows, but I definitely want to have an online element to most of the stuff I do. Uh, I'm doing a comedy masterclass with Soho Theatre and I'm giving, if anyone watching this wants to come and is in financial difficulty or is a person of colour, uh, I'm giving away some free tickets to that. Um, I'm excited to do more work and reach as many people as possible. And um, yes, writing and being in things that I can't talk about, but hopefully which will <laughs> happen. Very intriguing. Definitely going to keep close on your socials to see what those things are in time. <laughs> so if we've got one piece of advice for... Um, for LGBTQI women this year, or something empowering that you want to tell them to help them feel good about you know, the future, what would it be? Oh God. Hang in there. Hang yeah. in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, we're here for you. Yeah. 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 People, I think people are there for you more than you think they will be. Mm. You've kind of got like a British thing where you're like, you don't really want to talk too much about your problems, or even if you're like an overshare, you sort of like tactically share something about yourself, but then someone else speaks and so you can't get to what you really want to talk about. I think people, people are there. People like if you need to talk, if you need to speak, people will be there and the ones that don't listen are maybe going through something or not really worth your time. Like you will be able to find someone that gets it no matter how odd you feel, no matter how specific you think your problems are. There will be someone out there that gets it and people that will extend help. Mm. I think I, I've been asked this one a lot and I think the answer I've finally come to is that whether it's your gender or it's your sexuality or whatever it is, if you're a part of this community, that thing is yours. It belongs to you. It's not for your parents. It's not for God. It's not for the government. It's not for celebrities and YouTubers to tell you how to do it. Your queerness is yours. It belongs to you and you do it your way. And one of the, I think the best things about coming out, certainly for me, has been you take your life by the lapels and you say, no, this is mine. And like come fate into the lists, like this is my life now and I will take control of it. And just never give up on that fire because it's yours, it's a gift. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think that's really empowering and a, a wonderful adage to give people. Very cool.
Well, I think this has been an amazing discussion. So I'm really grateful to all of you for coming and talking to me today. So again, I just want to tell you about those social channels. You can at us at Student Pride, that's across the board, and use the hashtag NSP2021 for anything you want to comment on uh, during this discussion.